share with them this time of remembrance of the life of Peter Fleming. I'd like, on behalf of the family, to thank you for being here. Thank you for being present this evening. And I'll share with you this thought that uh, we have in the chaplaincy, and it's an expression that we call the ministry of presence. The ministry of presence, because at a time such as this, as we remember uh, the loss of a father, a brother, a brother-in-law, a friend, a co-worker, um, what can words do? What could words possibly do to be an encouragement? However, being here speaks volumes more than words could ever accomplish. So on behalf of the family, I would like to thank you for simply being here. Your presence is a ministry to all those who have suffered this loss at this time. And by extension, you happen to see some uh, cameras around. Uh, many of you are aware that uh, Peter Fleming was from Great Britain, and uh, the family is being very kind in uh, recording it this evening. Uh, so by extension, I would like to also welcome Peter's extended family in Great Britain as well, who will have the opportunity to uh, see this via video, hopefully in the near future. So we'd like to welcome them as well. We'd like to uh, uh, accomplish two things in our time together this evening, as brief as it is. The first is to honor the memory of Peter Fleming. Uh, very, I didn't have the privilege of but meeting him once. It was a very important meeting because he was bringing his son, Will, a boy Will, we know him as Will, uh, to the firehouse to uh, become a junior member. So I will always be thankful to Peter Fleming for that. Um, so we'd like to honor Peter's memory, but in doing so, I will ask you to keep in mind the expression of a healthful, Remembrance. If you look at your program, you'll see that we entitled this service Remembrance. And as you hear the remembrances of Peter Fleming shared this evening, I will ask you to think in terms of that expression, a healthful remembrance. Because it will be the, the memories that you hear, the memories that are shared, are going to be a source of health a source of healing and a source of encouragement to the Fleming family first, but also to all of you who are here who may have happened to know Peter. So as you hear them shared this evening, store them up. Think of those remembrances. Let them be helpful for you in moving forward. Will there be times of, of sorrow and sadness? Yes, great loss will bring that. But it's times like this this evening that will also afford not just the Fleming family, but all of you here the opportunity to grab a hold of something that is shared about Peter Fleming's life. That when those sorrows come, you have an encouraging word, a funny bit, 
from what I gather, Peter was quite a character. <laughs> You'll have something to, to hold on to, to, to be a touchstone, to be a, a something you can hold on to that will encourage you through that time of feeling the loss. <clears throat> we have several who have asked to share their remembrances first. And the first is um, Peter's brother, David. I'll ask you to come to the He was born at a very young age. <laughs> he was three years older than me, and we used to fight like crazy. I remember once when I was six, so he must have been nine, we were fighting over the drawers in a uh, chest thing. And he was bigger than I was because he was three years older and of course he, when I, I told him, I said, you're older than me, you are going to die first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, this could be one of the only really good honest gestures I've ever made. <laughs> <laughs> we all make mistakes, but maybe that wasn't one of them. But anyway, his, um, we actually got to be very good friends. He used to come out to us visitors in Wisconsin a lot, flying lobsters. And it was, we got to be much more friendly. I mean, we were, we were friendly before then, but much more friendly after we did those lobster trips, that was great. <coughs> and, and eventually we moved back from the Midwest to, to um, the East Coast. And it's been much easier for us to be with each other from time to time, which is, which is fine. In fact, we got to be so close that we would speak on the phone maybe uh, three or four times a week, you know. Of course, one of the real sad things is that the last conversation I had with him was the night before he died, and he, he and I were saying, how are we going to help look after things after he kicks off? <laughs> and then William gave me a call the next morning and said that he had kicked off. I thought it was just one of his jokes, you know. But no, it wasn't. And, and that's, that's about as sad. And so anyway, we remember Peter with loyalty and as a great friend, as a great brother too. <coughs> now I think we hand over to Annie. <laughs> Annie is my daughter from my first marriage. She's very smart lady. <laughs> At least that's what she tells me. <laughs> okay, so the reason we're all laughing is because my dad's first marriage, he had two girls, my sister Lisa and myself. And it's Lisa's the oldest and then me. And then with his new family he has also two daughters and there's an older Emily and a younger Cleo and always 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 he calls uh he flips our names and so he looked at Annie and Cleo anyway that hence so um yeah so I'm one of the kids that grew up with uh Uncle Peter he's this is my uncle here and I met William later in life because um, this was well after my parents had divorced and um, moved out, he, dad moved out to the East Coast. And it was, it was a nice um, addition because all of a sudden we had a, another connection with your dad that we may or may not have really did because we lived so far away. But with, with David moving back east here, we could still keep in touch. So I think the last time we saw Peter, was when you were 14 and we were in um, at dad's house in New Hampshire and your your dad um, you know you were get, just getting to know us you, myself and my two children up here 
and you had secretly said over to your dad, you know, is she, are these, are these one of the good ones? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm probably, you don't remember, but I'm going to say, yeah, these are, these are the good ones. <laughs> so, um, I want to share about my Uncle Peter that I remember, and um, with, I, we're going we're gonna to come back to this lobster thing that you might have heard about my dad. So my dad and Peter were um, private pilots, and Peter flew for a number of occasions. Um, my dad flew for just sort of personal um, reasons. So we uh, many times would, um, when we sh shared when I was with the mom and then we'd go to dad's house, dad would of course want to um, pick up his flight hours, so he would <coughs> fly to come pick us up and we'd meet at the airport and we'd fly home. It's kind of a interesting way to go visit mom or you know come back and forth but they invented these great trips we would do and sometimes we would go to mexico and we would just fly in, the, in our four-seater plane um down to these places and of course sometimes we'd go with uncle peter and he had the bigger airplane so we would go in his airplane and one of the trips um there was even more of us coming and there was a choice you know you i think uncle peter had kind of just a six-seater plane so just six of us could go on the airplane, and the rest had to drive in this car. And I think we were actually going to Mexico. And um, just to let you know what my choice was, was to actually go in the car. <laughs> because I get very motion sick, and Uncle Peter is just flies around. And <laughs> so, um, and that is kind of a way I look at how he was. We weren't in touch all that much um, over the phone, but when we were, it was just like everything's how it was. It was you picked up where you left off, and you, you told the same jokes, and you um, you just had every every part about him was just always present. So sad that um, we didn't get to spend more time with him, but I think. The time we did spend was just, hopefully you can understand me. Um, so, William, um, we're, you know, another family you have, and, well, I'm sure we'll be in touch more. And, um, so, my big sister, Lisa, couldn't come today, but she right now is sitting at the lake. At this time, uh, Peter's sister-in-law, uh, sister-in-law Joy Fleming, would like to share. And thank you all so much for being here. The the day that Peter died was a really tough 
day, but it was also a day that David and I just were so amazed at the community and the support um, and the the thing that Peter and William had here in Hopewell um, is a really precious thing, and we thank every one of you for being part of that. So I've now only known David and I only knew Peter for about 30 years. I came in late in the, in the cycle. Um, so I missed the whole lobster thing. Um, but Willie, uh, but Peter had always played the violin and I have always played the bassoon and David has always played the flute. And so we quickly started playing chamber music together. And this piece that we played today was probably the first piece that we played. And we just, it was our reprise. We just kept on coming back to it for all the special family occasions. And uh, Peter was a really versatile musician and really, really wonderful to play with. Um, we took a lot of shared vacations together and a lot of them had to do with music. Um, we watched William come as a pianist and a violinist and then as a trumpet player and um, one of the other people who came to our music va uh, vacations was a uh, music educator, so we all learned how to improv, and um, William just totally took off on the <laughs> trumpet, and he surpassed all of us on that. And this was all through uh, um, Peter's nurturing and support of everything that William needed and wanted. Um, if Peter and I were talking on the phone and the conversation kind of got all soggy, he would say, remember the gong show? Gong. <laughs> and we could just hang up. We didn't have to say goodbye. That was just the yeah. end. <laughs> when we took shared vacations, he would make plans, you know, which cars were going where, and et cetera. And we always had plan A. And we then we'd have plan B. And sometimes we'd even get to plan Z before we really had our plan. Um, he did one of his jokes that was especially for me. I'm a massage therapist, and he, um, how many people know about the homeopathic holy water? <laughs> okay, a few. So he bottled water, and he made a very fancy um, label on the water, and then he wanted me to sell it in my massage <laughs> So, um, over, you know, music, um, love, jokes. Um, overall, Peter was steadfast. If you were his friend, he would be there for you. He was there. Uh, his, his love for Megan was so apparent. Um, we went to Ireland for their wedding. It was beautiful. Um, he was just there for her. He's there. He was there for William and he just left us too soon. But um, with all the support of the community, um, this is this is a sentence that has no end. It's just thank you very much for your support. Being in my line of work, I wish I knew about the holy water, <laughs> especially locally bottled. It would have been very nice. Uh, there are uh, two other family members that have asked to uh, uh, to share at this time, and I'll ask them as they come. Uh, if you would please just let everyone know who you are and uh, your uh, relationship to uh, Pete. probably say something and so I wrote this up real quick so I'm gonna tell a little short story about Peter um, I wrote this two hours ago so don't judge me <laughs> so this is just like a little tribute to a great man it's called an obituary roast to Peter. <laughs> okay. 
A long, long time ago, in a country not too far away, <laughs> lived a happy couple in South Wales. Their life was pretty normal, a happy home with just a few dinosaurs roaming in the back garden, a conifer garden, side bushes and other greenery characteristic of the Mesozoic era. <laughs> Every morning, Olive, our grandmother, would go into the, grand, uh, to the garden and prune the bushes, <laughs> feed the dinosaurs, and scavenge for food, as was customary in those times. Her husband, Wilf, my grandfather, was a quirky man fascinated with mathematics and oftentimes could be found roaming the land in search of the equation that would determine the meaning of the universe. Most people in their village thought he was off his rocker. To that, Olive would always reply, Oh, bugger off and clean your brachiosaurus' feces off my drive. So they lived comfortably for many years until one day, Olive woke up with a weary feeling in her chest. Something was not right. She got up, stood with hands shaking by the window, trying to see whether a rogue T-Rex had gotten to her darling dino pets. Long, silent moments passed, gazing at her garden, when suddenly there was a huge flash of blue light that seemed to tear its way through the sky, followed by a deafening bang that shook the dust from the rafters and woke Wilf. Running to the window to meet Olive, they watched in horror as a huge meteor crashed just beyond eyesight, setting the earth to rumble uncontrollably. It felt like eons that they cowered in their tiny home, clinging to each other before the shaking died down. But finally, the dust settled and the sky cleared. When all was quiet, Wilf said, we have to go have a look about now, don't we? All, all, of, these accent, all of these voices should be in British accents, but I'm not gonna embarrass my family. <laughs> Olive, who was always curious to know the ways of the world, immediately went to fetch their hiking willies and compasses, saddled up their dinosaurs, and set off to the dust trail. It was nearly afternoon when they climbed up the huge crater. There they were, looking out over a huge basin of dirt, still warm from the impact. It was a terrible sight, but they couldn't help but feel a tremendous feeling of excitement at the possibility of what could lay in the middle of the bowl. A surprisingly small structure compared to the massive crater protruded from the dirt, metallic and crude looking, no larger than a small smart car. They dismounted and clambered down the steep slope towards the alien object. When they were just slightly under three and a half paces away, the mounts <laughs> suddenly shifted, started shaking, and then the top wrenched its way upwards, and a small hatch appeared. Unable to move, Wilf and Olive watched with amazed horror as the strange object moved without anyone there to manually operate it. Science, man. Science march today, guys. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Under the hatch arose a thin, transparent man panel on which an illuminated circle appeared. I think we're to, we're to touch it, Wilf said. Olive extended her hand and gently placed her palm onto, onto the glass. As if by magic, the hatch opened into a small chamber. <coughs> oh my, gasped Olive. Is it human? Laying peacefully on a white, fluffy mat, was the figure of a small infant. Well, what to do? asked Wilf, clearly dumbfounded at their discovery. Olive straightened up. It was apparent that she had made the decision about the child as soon as she saw it. Human or not, we're coming with us. There are T-Rexes about. We'll call it Peter, and we'll raise it as our own. <laughs> Thus, Peter Fleming came into being. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just okay. <laughs> Shortly after his arrival to this world, the impact of the meteor created a colossal disturbance in the force and disrupted the balance of nature so drastically that it caused the greatest mass extinction ever recorded in geologic history. Peter, Wilf, and Olive happily managed to survive this extinction, and after the glaciers melted, they continued their lives as they used to. They had another kid, my dad, got another pet, Percy the pig, and so on and so forth. 
Peter lived a great life from then on and was raised just like a normal human child would, but he always knew he was a little bit superior to the rest. <laughs> he followed his father's footsteps to study the mysteries of the universe. He married an amazing woman and had an amazing kid who shared some of his superhuman genes, teased his brother profusely, and excelled at stirring the pot, metaphorically speaking. Really, his regifting skills are unparalleled. <laughs> but sadly, all good things must find their end at some point, and Peter finally escaped his mortal coil and ascended to serve a greater purpose, sainthood. And he will be remembered fondly as the smartest and most important uncle, father, brother, friend, and neighbor that we have. On this day, we remember this great being. Let's raise our imaginary glasses to the legend of the great Peter Fleming. started to race. It was as if I was watching excerpts of a quarter of a century flashing in my memory. Some memories funny, some sad, and some heartbreaking. Then I began to collect my thoughts so that I might make some feeble attempt to honor this loving, devoted father, son, brother, uncle, and friend. Peter came into my life when I got a call from my sister-like cousin, Megan, who was anxious to introduce me to her English beau. I had just returned from London after some time, having a beau of my own be paralleled in this way. Pete, as I call him, approached us in his very best five pocketed cargo pants, <laughs> white shirt, slightly stained with coffee, <laughs> wrinkled tweed jacket, white wiry hair in dire need of cutting, because of the hairstylist I would know that, and a smile that would melt even the coldest of hearts. I felt small in the presence of such a great mind. Pete's having a PhD, was highly intelligent, but never made anyone feel inferior. He had a wonderful ability of not doing that. As time wore on, Megan and Peter gave birth to a beautiful boy on New Year's Day. I never saw a more loving and proud parent. Pete protected the newborn like a, like a proud papa bear. The next six years, the little family was perfect. Pete took Megan and William on countless trips abroad, keeping close contact with his own dad. We spent a lot of time with them on these years. Pete's always made family a priority. So whenever, so when, whenever it was a blow up pool on the deck for the kids, or a barbecue with Uncle John or Nana Max, we could always count on Pete. When Megan died, I wondered what kind of life Peter and William would have, minus one. Well, in true Pete's fashion, he showed us all a good one. Pete's more than rose to the occasion. What came then was one of the most incredible, loving, caring, attentive, nurturing, humorous, giving fathers that I had ever 
had the great fortune to know. Pete was, is, an incredibly generous man. LOL. We all know he was really frugal. <laughs> but the generosity I'm speaking of is in his time. Peter would do anything for anyone. Whether it was getting groceries, being picked up, researching illnesses, or even sharing his home. Peter never said no, except maybe to losing those cargo pants. <laughs> Pete, I know you are with Megan now. I pray the two of you watch over William or from where you are. And I promise I'll watch over him from here. We love you and we miss you. Wonderful remembrances. The family has uh, asked uh, to afford uh, those in attendance the opportunity if you would like to share your own remembrances. Uh, if you would like to do so, we just ask that you come up to the uh, podium and let us know who you are and, and how you knew Peter. So at this time, I'll ask, is there anyone else that would like to uh, share a remembrance of, of Peter? Very smart, though. very intelligent man, and 
we all have a lot of respect for him. He had a lot of patents, and I uh, was lucky to work with him for many, many years, and uh, not only work with him, but be a good friend inside and outside of work. And our family used to do a lot together, and I'm very pleased that we were able to do that. And uh, he was a wonderful man, always helpful, helped me a lot, and uh, he lived on in your room. I did that little bird at the back, if you want to read more. <laughs> the uh, blurb to which he refers is on the back of your program in case you'd like to refer to that. Anyone else? Good evening to those of you that don't know me. My name is Carolyn Bender. Um, I first had the opportunity to meet William um, shortly after his mother's passing. I, my daughter, who is here, uh, and William shared the same uh, school year. So I had the opportunity to see William grow, and it's been, it's been fabulous. Um, I got to know Peter because of his involvement. Um, I've been lucky enough to be a stay-at-home mom about the last dozen years or so, and Peter would outdo us all. He would come to every school function, multiple cameras around his neck, video camera in place, making sure we didn't miss a minute, um, and it was astounding. And one of the things that I really truly remember most about Peter was his generosity. I mean, certainly Will was always the catalyst for everything that happened. Um, but I can remember, you know, that position that we have every so often when you were, our children are in elementary school and we are classroom moms. And we have to beg for things through the year, you know, as we do donations for different organizations, or we have class functions going on. And I can remember that every fall in Hope Elementary, we used to do these huge class baskets. And we would, we would gather all of these items um, for whatever organization our class was assigned, and we would send out these letters to families and hope that they would send us either items or a couple dollars here or there. And I can remember being astonished. You know, you would always beg, you would get two or three dollars here, five dollars was a lot, ten dollars was a whole lot. And I can remember opening up the envelope one year, and Peter had sent me a check for fifty dollars for this basket. And just being shocked. And along it along with the check was a note that said, please let me know if you need any more. Um, that was unheard of. Um, a lot of things that Peter did were unheard of. <laughs> Um, and William is continuing that tradition and doing things that are unheard of, which has been such a pleasure. And while certainly I am sad that Peter has passed, what has been so lovely for me is to have an opportunity to get to know his extended family. Um, Joy and David and Cleo and Emily have been such a joy and have created such a nice, soft landing spot for William. <coughs> um, and then I just, I am lucky enough to take him once in a while and torture him like every other kind of a mom likes to. Um, but I can see that um, Peter did an incredible job. William, by far, is the most resilient kid that I will ever meet. Um, and I look forward to him attending Rutgers in the pre med program in the fall, or with my daughter, so I can torture them both and to know that they will tattle on each other. <laughs> Forewarned, Will. <laughs> Anyone else? Wonderful remembrances. Wonderful remembrances, and as I said at the outset, these are the things that I uh, ask each one of you, especially Peter's family, as the expression goes, to treasure up in your heart. Because it's these remembrances that will be sources of encouragement and strength and humor uh, in the days ahead. Um, we're not done with our remembrances. We have a special one. But first, uh, we'll ask that uh, the trio that has performed before uh, will now perform uh, once again. Um, they are, of course, uh, David and Joy, brother and sister-in-law. Uh, and also, um, many of you probably don't know, I just learned today, that uh, Peter took violin lessons throughout his life, uh, into adulthood as well. And we have the privilege of the third member of the trio, um, Ileana Chumak is, uh, uh, was Peter's uh, violin teacher here in this area. And uh, uh, Joy shared something with me today that I find quite humorous. He never referred to you, Ileana, by name. Uh, you were known as the uh, Romanian maestro. <laughs> so uh, that's just uh, one thing. And those of you who knew Peter, I'm sure that makes perfect sense. <laughs> The piece 
we are going to play was suggested by Margaret. Margaret was his first wife. We've had long talks with Margaret after Peter passed away, and she particularly wanted us to play some music which was very sincere and very moving and very appropriate for the, for the event. We're playing a piece, it's fairly short, uh, by um, Gabriel Foray, it's his Havan. Pictures of me and him 
and really sums up his life in their uh, view form. So. Peter Fleming was born to Wilfred and Olive Fleming on February 22, 1940, in Mansfield, England. Due to the ongoing war at the time, he and his family moved to a small town called Landstefan before finally settling down in Leicester after the conflicts had ended. Here, Peter attended Wigston Grammar School, where he quickly rose to the top of his class in maths and sciences, earning him scholarships to major universities. He eventually decided to attend Durham University, where he earned his bachelor's degree in physics. It was at Durham that Peter took an interest to the new and developing field of electrical engineering and decided to pursue a PhD in the subject at the University College London. After spending a brief period of time working in England, the now Dr. Peter Fleming immigrated to America to work at AT&T's high-tech Bell Labs in Princeton, New Jersey. At Bell Labs, Peter received several patents, published numerous reports, and won awards for his technical ability and knowledge in the field. He also built one of the world's first paint mixing machines, similar to what one would find today in any home improvement store. While working at Lucent, he also became a certified twin engine pilot, where he flew commercial charter flights on his free time. He also ran his own professional string quartet, where he played first violin. Peter worked at Lucent for 30 years and after retirement continued his passion for engineering by building his own computer numerical control device. A few years ago, he began using that device to build a cheap solar collector with the purpose of heating water. This machine had the potential to save millions of people thousands of dollars. Unfortunately, Peter did not live long enough to see his invention become reality. Peter will be remembered indefinitely for the contributions he has made to society through his work at Bell Labs. He was a great engineer and an even better person. While his life was a great success and filled with a vast amount of accomplishments, he will still be missed dearly and remembered forever. I regret not saying to my dad more often was how much I appreciated him as a parent. Since I was seven years old, my dad had acted as the sole parent with the task of turning a small bundle of guts and bones into a fully functioning member of society. This requires vast amounts of dedication and commitment and above all, personal sacrifice. While I can't remember much from my early childhood, I do recall how much my dad would try and do to make my experience growing up as fulfilling and as educational as it could possibly be. For example, uh, by the time I went to walk, he introduced me to music and spent hundreds of hours helping me practice, show from the around to rehearsals, and sitting down during my lessons. This resulted in my love for trumpet and a plethora of experiences that I would have never had if it wasn't for his dedication and self-sacrifice to me. My dad's commitment to me uh, shone through in elementary school where I was diagnosed with a vision disorder inhibiting my ability to read properly. As soon as he became aware of the problem, he turned to my personal vision therapist and he worked with me every day on vision exercises that were prescribed to me to correct my eyesight. With Nir, I was actually able to read and write normally, all thanks to his proactive approach to parenting. <coughs> oh, my dad was a great parent. He was also a, just a great person to hang out with. Shortly after my mom's death, we took our first father-son trip, which would end up becoming a yearly tradition. I have some funny memories from these trips, such as the time, time when my dad decided to try a smoked meat dish in Iceland, only to later find out that the way they smoke meat in Iceland is actually to put it in sheep manure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> of course, I had a great laugh over that. Uh, it was okay, though, because he got, 
he got me back the next year when I was uh, I was bit by a monkey in Gibraltar. Um, and the first thing he does, of course, is take a picture of the bite. Yeah. <laughs> and so he took his picture, and I got a tetanus shot. Uh, but I, I got him back the next year when uh, we were when we were mountain biking and. He fell off his bike, and this was Florida, and was old abandoned um, surface mine. And uh, it was pretty scary at the time because there was an alligator-infested swamp, and he fell off. Of it. And, and it was quite scary at the time, but afterwards it became a great memory. Um, and all these trips resulted in some great times. It also served a bigger purpose, and that purpose was to educate me about world, world cultures and give me a broader insight to life and turn me into a global citizen. I think he did a great job of that. Um, another thing I liked about my dad is while many parents find ways to ban technology from their children, my dad fully embraced it. <laughs> sure, Dr. Smith probably. <laughs> uh, and some of my best memories I had as a kid are uh, sitting on his lap in front of the computer as he taught me how to play his favorite games. So he'd play a lot of games like Doom 2, Wolfenstein, we'd always end up with a classic game of Tetris, and one of his things, Tetris was one of my dad's favorite games, because he'd brag about how he could get the score so high that it would actually start counting down to the computer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, we talked earlier about how my dad was a vision therapist and my chauffeur, but even in high school, my dad continued to invest vast amounts of time in helping me fulfill my dreams. Uh, most notably, before I had my driving license, my dad would drive me to and from the fire department every time there was an EMS call. And so dozens and dozens of times, my dad would stop whatever he was doing and take 20 minutes out of his life to get me down there so he could get patient care experience because I wanted to become a doctor. So. Um, and this was on top of already taking me to my instrument lessons, taking care of the house, attending to all the other business he had, he had to deal with. And uh, he truly was committed to my success and was ready to give everything so that I could fulfill my dreams. My dad is the reason I am where I am today. And over my years with him, we've become the best of friends and shared the greatest of memories. The qualities instilled in me came from my interactions with him. The successes I've had as a child and a young adult have come from his work as a parent. I, I, I owe everything to him and will forever be in debt for all that he has given me throughout my first 18 years of life. An amazing testament. I think that just about says it all. Before we have our last uh, portion of, uh, of our time of remembrance, uh, I will let you know that uh, there will be a, a reception following uh, the uh, time of remembrance today. Uh, the map is uh, printed there for you in your uh, brochure. So if you'd like to uh, head over to the Hobo Firehouse, I'm sure the Fleming family would be more than happy to, uh, to greet you there as well. We'd like to conclude our time of remembrance uh, with a moment of uh, giving you the opportunity to reflect on the remembrances that have been shared. If you recall, as I said at the beginning, uh, these remembrances are not just random. They are the source of encouragement and strength for the days to come. So uh, um, I've been asked to allow you the opportunity to, for just a moment, to pick one thing one thing that you've heard about Peter Fleming this evening. Just give me the moment to hold on to that. What made him special as a person, as a dad, as a brother-in-law, as, um, as a brother. Just think about that one of those things you've heard this evening. Think about that for just a moment. And let it honor Peter. And let it also become something of a touchstone that you can come back to during those times when you begin once again to feel that loss. After that moment, I will conclude with a uh, time of prayer. I will pray according to my tradition. I will ask that you would pray according to yours as I do so. So please think about anything that you've heard tonight, just that one thing. Let's have a time of shared remembrance, and then I'll close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening with thankfulness for the life of Peter Fleming. I'm sure, Heavenly Father, that there are many, many more things that could be shared this evening. But we are amazed at just hearing the tip of the iceberg as it were. Thank you. Thank you for bringing Peter Fleming to us, to this family, 
thank you for the blessing that his life has been to his family, friends, and even co-workers, neighbors, as we've heard this evening. We pause at this moment to simply say thank you. Thank you for a, a father, a dedicated father, a dedicated worker, a dedicated family member, brother, brother-in-law, friend. Thank you, Father. We also take this moment, Heavenly Father, to commit um, Peter's family to you. We ask that in the days ahead, as those, uh, as the pain of, of his not being there is felt, sometimes more strongly than others, we pray that the time this evening would provide them with a treasure trove of things to, to go back to, to hold on to, to be sources of encouragement, of laughter even, of joy, for the many, many things that Peter's life has meant to each one of them. We pray especially for Will, that you would keep your hand on this dear young man, and you would guide him in the days ahead. We pray that you would strengthen him and continue to make him a blessing to people as he's been to, to us at the department, as well as his friends who are here today. Father, we want to just want to thank you for uh, Will's aunt and uncle, uh, David and Joy, in a special way, who have, who have given of themselves in a special way to, to see William through this particular time. We ask that you would encourage them and keep them and, and give them wisdom um, for the decisions that need to be made uh, in the days ahead. Thank you for this time of remembrance, Heavenly Father. Thank you for this time to be together. Thank you for this time of remembering Peter Fleming. And we pray that in remembering, we would not only honor him, but be encouraged and even be better people as a result. In your name we pray with thanksgiving, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you again for coming. <coughs>